Hey everyone, so as has been the tradition on this channel for a couple of years at this point, towards the end of any given year I always make a video where I count down my favorite gaming experiences from the past 12 months, talk about the games that I enjoyed, maybe give you some recommendations and yeah, just give you some overall thoughts on what the year in gaming was like and what I enjoyed playing. To give you my overall thoughts on 2023, it's I think been a pretty good year for gaming at least when it comes to the types of games I like. Now, obviously there has been a lot of trash this year. There's always a ton of trash games coming out every single year, and that's been no different for 2023, but I think it's been easier than ever to ignore all of the crap that's coming out because there have been so many solid experiences. So yeah, let's go ahead and talk about these top 5 games that I decided to gather and that I love this year. Of course, before we go into that, this is all my personal opinions and it is entirely subjective. I think if you watch the channel or you're familiar with my content, you know what types of games I gravitate towards. I can certainly say if you enjoy Souls games, Metroidvanias, fighting games, action-oriented games and all of that, you are going to probably get some good recommendations from this, but I think you will be familiar with most of the games on this list. I think this was one of the first years that I could remember in a long time where there were actually a lot more games to choose from that I could have put on the list. As an honorable sixth entry, I decided to put the gameplay of Warhammer 40k Bolt Gun in the background for the intro and outro, just to give it a little bit of a shout out because it definitely would be the sixth entry, it's an excellent game and if the other five weren't so excellent it definitely would have made the list. The other big game from this year that probably would have appealed to me and I actually did like the demo of is of course Lies of P. Yeah, 100% would have made the list, the only thing is I never actually got around to picking up the full game and playing it, that's probably something I'll do next year, but I've heard nothing but good things about Lies of P overall. So yeah, what I can say is, I highly recommend all of these games, let's get into the list, and yeah, do let me know your top games as well, because I'm interested in maybe getting some recommendations too, and naturally, there is going to be more content coming in 2024, so if you do like what you're seeing, like, comment, do all the usual, subscribe, because I'm definitely going to be picking up uh, making videos regularly again as we get into the new year. So without further ado, number 5 on our list is going to be... Blasphemous 2. There were a lot of Souls likes that came out this year, I think with varying degrees of quality. I would say on the one hand you had games like Lords of the Fallen, which pretty much missed the mark. You had the aforementioned Lies of P on the other end. To some of Blasphemous 2, this game is firmly in the good end of the scale. I think this is a fantastic 2D Souls-like Metroidvania, arguably I think the best that has come out this year. Now, I think 2D Souls in general is difficult to nail. I think it's way tougher to make challenging enemies and bosses and create interesting levels when you are missing a dimension. You have to account for a lot by not being able to dodge in a 3D environment when making bosses and enemies. You have a lot more limited spacing and movement and etc. I think a lot of 2D Souls games fail because they try to make bosses and enemies as tough and as fast as 3D Souls when that's never going to work. It's completely different controlling a character in a 3D space with that type of camera than controlling a tiny little sprite on screen. Blasphemous 2 basically skips all of these teething problems and actually manages to come up with coherent challenging enemies as well as some excellent bosses. I think the bosses in this game present the pinnacle of how 2D souls can be done right, bridging sort of the balance of what a metroidvania type game would have as well as having still the elements of challenge and souls combat in it. I think the game's world is fascinating, I think it's one of the most unique with its like Christian Lovecraftian Inquisitor theme, it pretty much picks up with the same themes as Blasphemous 1 but refines them a lot better. I think the Metroidvania mechanics as well are better than ever, I do like that you now have actually three weapons to pick from, one of my main criticisms for Blasphemous 1 was that combat got boring after a while having only access to one weapon. That's completely changed, you now actually have three weapons classes to choose from, which also lead to more interesting traversal abilities, as well as you have things like a double jump and air dash and all of that. 
In fact, basically everything that I liked about the first Blasphemous and the reason it placed high in my Souls tier list is intact in Blasphemous 2. But I think Blasphemous 2 does a lot to iron out essentially every issue and complaint I and many other people had with the first game and iterates on it perfectly. Listen, if you are familiar with the first game, you are going to love everything that's in Blasphemous 2. Everything you liked about that game is intact here. But with the three weapons, way more upgrades, way more spells, much better movement, I think the game being a little bit easier to navigate, uh, the removal of some really annoying mechanics like insta-kill pits, I think it's just a really great tightening of the already fantastic Blasphemous 1 experience. If you love souls, you love a dark world and lore, you enjoy metroidvanias, you want to look at a beautiful pixel art art style, you owe it to yourself to check out Blasphemous 2. In fact, continuing on, speaking of metroidvanias, number 4 on the list is going to go to... Metroid Prime Remastered. I know some people think it's cheating to put remakes and remasters on these types of lists, but honestly, I don't care. I'm sure both this game and the Resident Evil 4 remake are going to top the year-end lists for many people and publications. You guys know that I have a deep love for Metroid Prime. I'd say it's one of my defining gaming experiences. The GameCube was the second console I owned, and Metroid Prime was the first game I got on it. And I just remember my 9 year old self being just blown away by this game in every aspect. Well, 21 years later, holy shit, I can confidently say that Metroid has lost none of its excellence. In fact, it's absolutely shocking how well this game has held up, to the point that you could, I think, 100% convince someone who knows nothing about the series that this game is brand new. If you love Souls games and Souls likes, you should definitely check this game out. Within the first 30 minutes, you will notice that the Metroid Prime DNA is burned into every single one of the Souls games. What I'm talking about is that the gameplay is challenging, especially if you play on hard mode. You have a lonely, desolate world with sort of a strange beauty to it. The game not holding your hand at all lore coming primarily from item descriptions, the challenging bosses, uh, the progression system. No wonder so many Souls and Souls adjacent games ape this formula. It just works. It's a testament to this game's quality that, I think aside from a shiny new coat of paint in the remastered and some quality of life mechanics that we'll touch on, this game is essentially unchanged from its 2002 form. That's how well this game holds up. And to talk about the quality of life changes that are here, they are fantastic. Of course, the graphics looking nicer is a great nice to have feature, but the biggest improvement definitely is the shooting. While the original Prime was focused on locking onto your enemies with sort of a limited free aim function, the game now functions essentially as a full FPS, and while I was initially worried about this change, it actually only affects the game positively. Of course, you have the option to go for the classic controls. You can turn the uh, the free aim entirely off. You can go for even the Wii style controls, which were featured in the collection that came out on the Wii. But honestly, you shouldn't. It's incredible how much more fluid and smooth the game works with the FPS style combat. It really, really improves the overall experience. Listen, I know I'm biased in favor of this game. How could I not be when it's such a pivotal experience in my life? But truly, Metroid Prime is as good in 2023 as it has ever been. And this remastered is the perfect way for anyone to get a taste of this series if you've missed out on it previously. All I can hope for now is that the other two games in the trilogy will get the same treatment because first of all, they deserve it. And second, there is no better representation of what a Metroidvania could achieve than the Metroid Prime trilogy. Moving on to game number three, we have Hi-Fi Rush. So, not to brag, but when I was like 13 and the world was in peak Guitar Hero rock band mode, I had an idea that an action game with rhythm game timing mechanics could be really fun. Well, in 2023, that dream is now a reality with Hi-Fi Rush. And by the way, I will be taking all of the credit, thanks. Hi-Fi Rush is one of the best compact, self-contained single-player hack-and-slash experiences in a long, long time. This, in my opinion, is exactly what gaming needs nowadays. 
instead of bullshit, gigantic 80 hour, you know, microtransaction filled, always online grind fests, why can't we go back to having excellent self-contained 10 hour single player experiences that are made with love and crafted to perfection? Luckily, Hi-Fi Rush is just that. If you don't know the main gimmick of this game, it's a hack and slash where everything flows to the rhythm of music. And by everything, I truly mean everything is on beat. It's actually crazy how much attention to detail there is in making everything in the environment and every movement sync up to what is playing in the background. Combat revolves around this rhythm mechanic as well, where you are rewarded with extended combos and more damage as well as a better score for tying attacks to the rhythm. And man, this mechanic is just simply too much fun. What I love about Hi-Fi Rush is that it has this very skill-based mechanic, but it never actually punishes you for missing things. Your attacks always are on beat, but having good timing leads to better combos, scores and more damage. Also, the game adds a ton of options, not in just in terms of accessibility, but ensuring that you can stay on beat even if you're not musically inclined. This means that the game is set up in a way where you want to do well. I can tell you, I've purposefully restarted sections of levels where I felt like I didn't do well enough. In many ways, this is exactly why Guitar Hero and the likes were so addicting, because if the game is done well and the game mechanics are addicting, you want to go back and you want to improve and do better. Of course, besides the rhythm-based hack and slash mechanics, this is just a damn good action game in general. There are interesting and varied enemies, good platforming sections, a good mix of platforming and, and combat, great bosses, and on hard mode the game does offer quite a good challenge. This is all combined with a genuinely charming cartoon presentation. I think this is one of the best looking cell shaded games that I think I've ever seen. And I just love that the game has this Saturday morning cartoon vibe while managing not to overdo it. Seriously, so many modern games coming out try so hard to be funny, <laughs> like Saints Row from last year, with like this really annoying, condescending, millennial Marvel quip style humor that just comes off as incredibly grating after a while. Hi-Fi Rush does the impossible and manages to genuinely be funny with like actual slapstick, observational humor and good dialogue, but it also knows when to dial it back and take, it, take itself seriously. Nothing is ever overdone. This is no Borderlands 3 where literally every other sentence ends in some dumb joke. The soundtrack of course is predictably excellent, the game has a great selection of original tracks and actually some banger licensed music as well from bands like the Black Keys and Nine Inch Nails. And you know, overall this is just one of those games that puts a smile on your face. When you are flowing to the combat, getting the good combos and dodges with the beautiful cell shaded visuals and the excellent soundtrack playing, you just can't help but be entertained. I hope the success of this game and the overwhelming positive reception it has received is taken as an inspiration. There is so much potential for, as I mentioned, the self-contained, well-crafted single-player games to make a comeback, and I hope when they do, they will all be as high quality as Hi-Fi Rush. Number two, we're getting to the real good ones here. Uh, this entry is going to go to Armored Core 6 Fires of Rubicon. Yeah, I don't think there's a single person that's surprised by this, really. I've absolutely been blown away by Armored Core 6. Honestly, when the game was initially announced and we got some initial glimpses, I had my worries, can't lie. Mainly, I was worried that FromSoft would just make a Souls game with a mecha skin on it. What I really wanted is for Armored Core to retain all of the qualities that actually make it Armored Core. My worries, it's safe to say, of course, were unfounded. AC6 does something very special in reviving a series that hasn't had a mainline entry in what, like almost a decade, maybe even over a decade, retaining everything that made the old games unique, but also adding and modernizing just enough to help new players. In fact, this might be controversial, but if I had to pick between the two most recent From releases to play, Armored Core 6 or Elden Ring, I would pick Armored Core 6 99% of the time, because this game is so much closer to what I personally want in a game. In fact, Armored Core 6 for me does something very special. It's one of those rare games that actually helps me get into an entire franchise. You guys remember early on in the year I played Armored Core 3? 
However, I honestly did not enjoy the game initially. Uh, the game had confusing controls. I didn't understand the mission structure, where to go, you know, what to do, how to build an AC, how to do well in combat, etc. Well, all of that has now disappeared after playing Armored Core 6. AC6 made me love this series. I've since come back and played Armored Core 3 completely. I've gone through Silent Line and I'm currently making my way towards Armored Core 2 and I'm planning to get through the entire series as well. Armored Core 6 brings the same fluidity, tightness, great controls and tactical combat that you find in Dark Souls and it contains everything that makes a From game brilliant but it also does so much more. First of all, I just love the setting. On my very first playthrough, I was not the biggest fan of the story, but I actually now love it. The dialogue is great, the voice acting is expertly done, and just like previously with Hi-Fi Rush, it has none of the annoyances that many other game dialogues have, you know, the over-explanation, stupid jokes, quips, etc. The dialogue and the story perfectly fit the world, and if you dig a little bit into the overall lore, things actually get quite interesting and quite deep. There are some genuinely great and complex characters found here, talking about Air and Handler Walter, and despite the fact that all of the dialogue is done through these like radio broadcasts or radio conversations, the characters actually feel complex and fleshed out by the end. I also love the game world, the huge industrial feel of Rubicon with these giant structures and just like huge floating things and robots and all of that. Everything just dwarfs your 10 meter tall robot. Things just get so crazy with the fact that everything is also done to scale. The combat is simply brilliant. You have so much freedom in this game to express yourself. Sure, initially you will need to tailor your AC a lot. You will have limited parts and sort of build to every situation and mission. But as you get more of the parts, you get more money, you pick up the legs and other parts for your AC, you will soon discover that basically any build can work anywhere. Tank, light, floating, tetrapod, laser weapons, kinetic weapons, more of a melee style, it doesn't matter, you have the ultimate choice. And I think the game's combat is really about finding the style of combat that appeals to you. In fact, the freedom this game allows with its builds and the variety it has with the weapons is a fantastic way to let you control the difficulty. To give you an example, I made it a point to play a tank build on my New Game Plus run. It gave an extra challenge to me because I don't actually enjoy playing tank builds too much and it gave me a completely new experience and type of situations that I had to find a way to deal with. The mission structure for this game is brilliant. I know From did great with the open world of Elden Ring, but I love the self-contained nature of this game. I think it's a great game for pick up and play sessions, mainly with the story being complex, but also not really being something that plays too much into the game. You can safely ignore the story and just focus on the missions. This game is excellent for just picking up, blasting through a couple of missions, maybe playing some arena or multiplayer and then just coming back later. And finally, what I adore about this game is that From demonstrated that they are not a one-trick pony. Sure, Armored Core is difficult, it does retain a lot of the elements from the Soul series, but what I love about it is that both the combat, the idea of the entire game and the difficulty is completely different to what Souls offers. You'll see it on Twitter as well after this game came out, if you look back. People were just like absolutely baffled that you can't just like panic dodge or heal your way out of problems here. You have to be tactical using your weapons, loadouts and the uniqueness of your AC build to win. And with that it's just so much more tactical and deep than many of the Souls games where if you're good enough with dodging and healing, you can basically brute force your way through any encounter. Sure, of course, that's possible in Armored Core 6 as well, there are naturally some incredibly OP builds, but I think this game lets you control difficulty like no other. Essentially, this game is a phoenix down for an entire franchise. I hope, just hope that this is a sign for things to come and we not only get DLC for this game, but also more Armored Core in the future, because man, I am absolutely addicted to this series now and I can't wait to play more AC games. And with that we finally get to number one, my game of the year for 2023, and this is going to go to Street Fighter 6. I can't lie, it was a close tie between this game and Armored Core 6, 
but overall I have to give my game of the year to Street Fighter 6. Fighting games are I think in a renaissance right now, and there is no better redemption arc than SF6. Street Fighter V, as we all know, was trash on release, but the game slowly got better and better over the years as more things were added, the online got fleshed out, character balance was redone, the game really had a great improvement and actually turned out to be a pretty good fighting game by the end. Street Fighter VI, on the other hand, comes right out of the gate swinging. Street Fighter as a series has always been held in high regard for its gameplay, but now with SF6 being such a complete package, Capcom have now unseated NRS in being the gold standard for what fighting games could offer, both in terms of offline content, story mode and online. Especially since MK1, as you know, was such a huge miss, I think. Truly, whether you are a casual, a pro, new to fighting games, a veteran, you want to play online or compete or just mash out buttons with your friends, SF6 will have something for you. And that's the special thing I think about this game, in that it manages to take a very niche genre and shows that yes, fighting games can be mainstream, they can be accessible and have wide appeal without dumbing anything down for those who want to learn the game and the professionals. So let's go through and talk about all of the features that are in SF6. Let's talk about offline content first. And to talk about the story mode first, I actually really like what's on offer here. It has that PlayStation 3 type era game charm to it, but not in like a forespoken way, but more in like a Yakuza way, in that it's sort of more charming and self-referential. As you guys know, NRS changed the way fighting game story modes work, but I think the mistake NRS has made is that they haven't actually innovated on the quote-unquote we're cinematic, we switch between characters every chapter formula in like over a decade. Street Fighter 6 I think feels like the future, being a sort of light RPG beat-em-up hybrid. Capcom is the perfect studio for this because they have some classic beat-em-up games under their belt and it's really obvious they took a lot of inspiration from that. While I'm never a huge fan of fighting game story modes, I usually just blast through them, I have to say Street Fighter 6s did keep me engaged for a long time. While I haven't finished it yet, I do go back occasionally and play it and keep progressing because it's not something where I was just like, oh yeah, screw this, I'm never gonna touch this again. The single player fighting mode this game offers is quite significantly good as well. The AI, while still being an input reading cheating bitch, feels more human than I think in any other fighting game I've personally played. Seriously, a level 5 to 7 CPU I think is as close to feeling like you're playing against someone else than you could ever get and it actually gets kind of scary. This way, even if you never touch online or you want to practice, mash out combos, you have the classic fighting game experience. You can simulate fighting against an opponent and it's not just gonna feel like you have uh, some like dumb AI reading your inputs, but the CPU actually makes logical choices, does combos and tries to behave like another player. Is it the best way to practice? I would say no, but it's definitely there as a fun option. Shifting to the online, first of all, the tutorial and the teaching methods this game provides are just perfected. It's so easy and logical to learn using the tools SF6 gives you. The tutorials and the practice options, the built-in training, combo challenges are all fantastic. The game is great at making fighting game concepts accessible to people and actually teaching you what to do and what it's actually talking about. What I think really adds to this, and speaking of accessibility, are the modern controls that are on offer here. I think this is actually a brilliant idea, as controversial as modern controls are. I know people to this day still bitch about and shit on modern controls, but listen, in my opinion, it's just impossible to make an accessible control mode that actually pleases everyone. I think there is no better way currently than modern to simplify complex Street Fighter controls. Sure, there is definitely some cheapness here, you can argue about that, you have the one button supers, the one button DPs, but the fact is, for fighting games to be sustainable, they need to draw people in somehow. And I think modern does this brilliantly. 
The best part is that the game's complexity is still retained even if you play modern. Whatever control type you play, you still need to have an idea about fighting game fundamentals, like movement, spacing, knowing your opponent, etc. In that way, the core experience is fully retained. And of course, as players get better, they can stick with modern or switch at any time or keep a hybrid playstyle, whatever works for you. Online is smooth for the most part. I think this game has a really solid online actually, probably the best since Mortal Kombat 11, which I think had fantastic overall online stability and connections. And even when the game has some issues with like Wi-Fi or lag, it gives you all of the tools to tailor your experience. Listen, the Wi-Fi filter here is available by default. It's not gonna take like four months post-launch for it to be added. In fact, I think the online is streamlined. That's the best way I can describe it. And again, this game presents what the gold standard can be. Not to mention, there are so many ways to tailor lobbies, lounges, you have the, uh, the battle hub, um, online tournaments, etc. You just have so many ways to play. The community aspect in this game is better than ever. I, and I think it's easier than ever to get a group of people together and play in whatever mode you want. All I can say is I adore Street Fighter VI. It has been by far my most played game of 2023. What I talked about here barely touches all of the positives I can talk about this game. From the music, the fact that it brings back this hip hop aesthetic that was found in Street Fighter 3, the absolutely gorgeous art style, the game is fantastically animated. Seriously, there's no better proof than how well this game an is animated than if you go on YouTube to look at SF6 gameplay and you slow down the footage. And the fact is that it even looks fantastic at like half speed or quarter speed. There is just so much to say here that I could sit here for a long time and talk about this game, but all I can sum up is it's my most played game of this year. It is a game that I will continue to be engaged with for a very long time. I cannot wait for the additional characters, the eventual balance changes and the continual development of this game because this game has so much potential. It's if SF5 could have such a huge uptick and be so good by the end, Imagine what the potential is here for Street Fighter 6. All I can say is if you are in any way new to fighting games or are intimidated by them, do not be scared to try out Street Fighter 6. There is no better entry point into this great genre. Uh, there are so many ways to tailor your experience. Enjoy this game both offline and online. The controls are accessible. Truly, no series has had such an insane redemption arc and there's no better time to get into fighting games than now, and I think Street Fighter 6 is a fantastic place to start. All I can say is GG's Capcom. And with that, we officially wrap up my top five games list for 2023. Like I said, it's been a great year for gaming, played a lot of fantastic games, still have quite a few on my bucket list for next year, Lies of P is definitely top. Of course, we have Tekken coming out next year early, the Elden Ring DLC, so there is a lot more down the pipeline. As I said at the start, all I can say is hope you guys enjoyed this video. Let me know what games made your list for this year that you really played. And yeah, I hope to catch you guys in 2024 as well. So thanks for watching, peace out, and goodbye.